John probably set the whiteboard right in front of me so you can see, I won't be able to see me. Actually, I need to turn it. It looks like it's aiming towards the whiteboard. So if you don't mind, I'll move it just a little bit. Anyway, uh, today's subject, first of all, I was going to start off with alternative electrical energy systems and off-grid tied, off-grid and grid tied systems both. First of all, uh, we talked a little bit with a couple of you guys. Some of you have talked about grid tied systems. Grid tied systems, one of the things about it, there is, in most cases, some money available for people. Uh, one of the things about a grid tied system is that if you have a grid tied system and it's been funded partly by a utility, you probably will not have electricity when the electric grid is down. Uh, they now, set it up. I'll tell people what a grid tie system is, they don't know. Okay, a grid tie system is where instead of using batteries for storage, that you actually take a bunch of solar panels, set them up on your house, and run them to the electrical system through a transfer switch. And the utility company actually controls that if they pay you money on it, which means you can't shut it off and disconnect it and use it when the electrical grid is down. If the grid is down, you're down. The advantages of it is that batteries are the most expensive and the most consumable product basically of an off-grid system because batteries you have to maintain, you have to replace and all that kind of stuff. So some people opt out on doing batteries. My recommendation for everybody is always get a battery system and start as small as you have to because you can always add more batteries as you have money or you might even find somebody that's jumped a bunch of cars and pulled a bunch of batteries. Whatever you can use, as long as the batteries are good, you can build you a good system. And by the way, you can use 12 and 6 volt batteries. So if our 24 is too, but the fact is, now 24 is the only way you can use them is if you have a 24 volt or larger system. If you've got 6 volt batteries, you can parallel them and make them, our series them and make them 20, or 12 volt or 24. 12 volts, you can also series and make 24 volts. So, as long as you've got a battery system generally the same voltage, you can use it. You, they say not to put different size batteries, and the truth is if you have different size batteries, your system will not work as well as if you use all the same kind of batteries. You know, not the same kind, same size. Um, I worked with a system that's nickel iron, which is one of the most expensive methods of, of storing electric. But nickel iron also is the ones you can overcharge, undercharge, and everything else, and they keep on going. They're also called Edison batteries. So the Edison battery is probably one of the best batteries out there, but it's expensive. One other thing before I get into the discussion, since we're talking about this part, the batteries themselves, nickel iron, will charge very, very well, but they do not discharge rapidly. So if you put a big load on a system, your nickel iron may cut out on you. They'll literally just cut out and quit operating. You have to go back and restart your system. They're building hybrid systems now where they take nickel iron and use them and then they put the lead acid with them because lead acid batteries will give you a very big surge very fast and those are the things you need for electric pumps, you know, welders, stuff like that. Of course, anything you put on there unless you have the right inverter doesn't matter. It's not going to work right. So you also have to have those. I'm going to break those down as we go through. But that's what a grid tie versus a non grid tie system is. If you have batteries, you're probably not grid tied, but some people are using batteries and grid tied, but they don't get any money from the utility company. That way you still own it, and it's legal to do that. My recommendation if you're going to grid tie, grid tie, put batteries in too. One of the things you've got to realize if you have to add electricity to your batteries and you're using a generator, and if you're a grid tied system, you can actually take a charge, a battery charger and hook it into your system to charge your batteries and run it back through. That does not mean you get free electric. It means that you're pulling electric off the grid to charge your battery system where either the solar panels or the hydro or whatever you're using to add the energy is not taking care of the needs you have. So there's a lot of different ways to do stuff. Most of it, if you'll talk to me, I'll be glad to talk to you and share with you. I'm basically, I had this attitude, I'd like to see all the utility companies go bankrupt. <laughs> and, you know, I believe that it's one of the biggest problems we have right now is the energy. And if most of us look back in history, uh, especially in America, energy is what made America great. We made good incomes and energy was cheap. 
Now most of us are making very poor incomes and energy is very expensive. So it kind of turned to tables and they're making all the money. <coughs> so that's one other reason. I think if you get off to where you can produce your own energy, you'll have more spendable money. You know, that's what we're all looking for is more spendable money. And don't get me wrong, I have to make a living. Uh, things are for sale. Uh, there's not a lot of profit in any of it. And if you want to ask questions, it is not a charge to ask questions for me. I want people to do all they can to get off grid. And I hope everybody in here is off grid in the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and start my subject here. Uh, first of all, before you consider going off grid, uh, and it's absolutely, you will need to very carefully consider just how you are willing to live. Not how you can live, how you're willing to. And then it, you, your lifestyle, and most of all, the things you can and cannot do without. You all need to make a list. If you are actually considering, even for uh, just as a backup system, these are things you need to consider because we know for a fact that the grid's going down at different times, even if it doesn't go down permanently. You know, we've been without electric for almost five days at my house not a year ago, and uh, some friends of mine was down for almost two weeks a couple, uh, couple years ago. And I don't think it's going to get any better. So. What you need to do is figure out what you can and cannot live without and what you really want to live with or without. And the reason you have to do that is determine where you're going to build your system, how much money you're willing to spend, and what you're going to do to make that work. So especially make a list. You should make a list of, let me see, a list as one of the very first steps considering an off-grid system. And here are some of the essentials for the usage. Of course, we all need lighting. Lighting has gotten very, very easy to access. So I actually bought some lights the other day for less than 10 bucks that has four AA batteries that snap on the wall or magnetic on the back, and you can turn them on any place you want. There's no wiring. And if you get yourself a, a small battery charger and buy some uh, rechargeable AA batteries, basically you've got lights for the next 10 years. So. That is a very good option as far as for backup lighting. Lighting is not near as critical for the energy system as your refrigeration is going to be. Refrigeration is number one, I think, with all of us because most of us, first of all, don't know how to preserve most of our foods. And secondly, if we do, we like it from the freezer a whole lot better than we do after we've done something to preserve it. So. Uh, dry goods are good. Uh, there's lots of ways to do it. The refrigeration is going to be the number one thing that most of us are going to need. I've got several high efficiency refrigerators and freezers and I think those are important. Uh, next is going to be, <coughs> as a whole, you're going to need pumps. Motors, basically. Motors are very, very good on an off-grid system as far as for they don't run it down near as fast. Okay, if you have a load, they're going to run more, of course. Motors for an air conditioner definitely are not acceptable. Uh, you might get a little bit of run out of them, and if you do, you're going to put a whole lot of extra panels in to get the cooling. Uh, I'm actually looking into, because I've got an old refrigerator I took out of an RV, and I've been looking online, that some of that stuff will actually give you some backup cooling, and you can use heat. So, you know, it's kind of neat to hot, heat something up and get air conditioning out of it. Um, Water, we're going to need circulating, whether it's air or water, we're all going to need some kind of pumps. And of course, sewing machines, and I've got the washing machines, and of course that's a, a washing machine's usually not too bad either. Uh, TV communications, uh, dryer. Remember, I, a gas dryer is all you can basically use on an off-grid system. You know, you might use the other one, but it's going to cost you $10 to dry a load of, of clothes, so it's not practical. But uh, if you buy a gas dryer and the motor's all it's running, you're, you're in pretty good shape. And uh, <coughs> same thing with furnaces. Uh, gas, wood, or solar assist is really, really good on any kind of heating system you have. Uh, I have wood. Probably most of you have wood. I have a gas furnace, too. And uh, when we were down, this is one thing I really want to share. When we were down, I've only got four panels right now at the house. And they're all 250 watt basically, so I've got a thousand watt system. And I've got lots of extra batteries. So 
batteries are, are probably the, if you want to call it the, the biggest thing that you want to be careful and do as much of as you can. You can never, in fact, I'm going to read you a little bit in Mother Earth News. Uh, I use a lot of Mother Earth News information I have for 30 years almost. But your batteries, if you put extra ones in, there's two things. First of all, you have to be able to get them charged. So if you can't get them charged, the batteries aren't going to do you any good. But as long as you can get them charged, your batteries are the most important thing because that's what you're going to run down. And people that use like a weekend home, it's excellent because they can put three or four batteries in and they can charge all week with the solar panels and then come down, they have good charged batteries. <coughs> if you use it on a daily base, the problem is you run your batteries down too much and they won't ever charge back up enough. And what I did with mine, I've got a little 2,500 2, watt generator and I actually put a half a gallon of gas in it and start it. And I usually start early in the day and I'll go into this a little more down here. But the generator will charge your batteries up to where when you're using your solar, your wind and all that, you'll actually get the most efficiency out of your charging system. If you wait till the end of the day, you basically wasted it because when you've got the most sun and the most energy going in, you're draining your batteries instead of having them up high. So you want them as high as possible so they're floated up over voltage. <coughs> Anytime anybody's got a question. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, as far as hooking up a generator in line with the, <coughs> with the panels and then going through the, the controller, mm -hmm. does that damage the controller? Most of them are made where <coughs> you can use either one of them for the input. Just, just a plain But I don't think most of them will be charging with both of them at the same time. Now I know what you can do is take a generator and hook it directly to your batteries on the DC side and put it into your batteries. That's how I did mine, by the way. I have my generator hooked directly into my battery system. So that puts it in there. What I actually do instead of that, because my generator only has like 10 amps of output, but I put my generator on and I have a 50 amp battery charger and I use the 50 amp battery charger to charge my batteries. So I don't even tie it to anything. It's directly from my generator to my battery charger to my batteries, which eliminates all the other electrical stuff. And you don't want to do anything you don't have to to any of your system, including your charge controller, because it's expensive. And when you damage it, it's very expensive to get fixed or replaced. So, yes, sir. Alan, you want to go over the difference between the Iron Edison alleged nickel iron batteries and Zapwerk genuine Edison batteries? Yes. Uh, first of all, nickel iron batteries, uh, there's a lot of them out there. Some are made in China and they're very poorly made. <coughs> and, uh, excuse me just a minute. Uh, you want to explain the difference, Calvin? On the plates, <coughs> the difference on the plates. I'm not sure what you're talking about. The plates are... Well, the, the ones, the Iron Edison batteries, they have nickel plated iron. Oh, good. you mean the cheaper ones? Exactly. Yeah, the cheaper ones will be redesigned in a way that they break down. They actually have a life expectancy of anywhere from 20 to 50 years. But every year they get worse. Where the nickel iron batteries are made in such a way that they keep on being able to, you can use them for basically a thousand years if you maintain them. They, they are actually, basically you flush them and replenish them if you have to at some point. But nickel iron batteries will not go bad on you if you have the ones that John's talking about that Zapworks has. Did they start manufacturing them now, yet? I haven't, uh, I haven't talked to them in a few months. They, they're, they weren't back in production last time. But actually, Calvin, the, the Iron Edison batteries are running about 10 to 12 years before the nickel starts flaking off the iron, which basically you're looking at the same as a, a good quality Trojan battery, you know, 10 to 12 years. That's oh, you lot. mean before they start? Precisely. Yeah. Um, so what's the point yeah. <laughs> if they're only going to last 10 or 12 years? Yeah, Th they're, they're supposed to be, and the good ones, now is that the, that's not theirs, so any of theirs, right? That's just strictly the ones, are, is that what they're going to be yeah, building? I don't know where Iron Edison are made, but uh, they're not the real deal. Okay. It's, it's just nickel plated iron, as opposed to a nickel iron, uh, uh, genuine nickel iron alloy. 
Yeah, the ones like me and Jasper right. have, and right. people like that that bought the old ones that were yeah. Because if you can find anybody that's remanufacturing any, the oldest ones out there are the best. They're the ones that literally you don't wear them out. So that's why. Yeah, I don't even tell anybody much about the ones that are in China and stuff like that because when you buy them, you're wasting your money. You're going to pay two to three times, maybe even four or five times as much, and they aren't going to last. So. Unless you're getting the real thing, don't buy them. And uh, you might as well just go with Trojans or something like that. That's what I sell basically as a Trojan now. And it is made for basically off-grid and stuff like that. And uh, so the Trojan battery is much better. Remember, and I'm going to read you something since we're into the batteries quite a bit. This is in Mother Earth News, and it says, The batteries are the only part of our electrical system that requires regular attention. I monitor the battery's state of charge and periodically add distilled water to them. You need to ensure that your batteries never fall below 50% of their charge. Never paying an electric bill or experiencing a power outage is more than enough to compensate for the time I spend to maintain batteries. In other words, what they're telling you, and that's true, then one thing that you always have to maintain on a system is your battery's water level, whether you're using nickel iron whether you're using the uh, regular lead acid. Now there are some gel batteries out there, but you don't get near the input out of them, and most of those you do not have to maintain any kind of a liquid in them. So uh, I've got one person that actually built a whole system out of those. Uh, this is the other thing I was going to tell you guys, and I kind of shared with you already. The other particular in here says, lesson, don't undersize battery banks in off-grid installations with today's low uh, photovoltaic panel prices strive to oversize both your solar array and your battery bank. You'll worry less about maintaining an electrical system and you'll run your generator much less often. Those are two of the biggest things about the best battery system you put in is going to keep you from running your generator and it's also going to give you the most available energy. And as long as you keep your batteries charged fuller, like I was telling somebody earlier, is they don't break down near as much as if you run them real high and low. Now the true nickel iron, you can drain them basically. They go down to like 30 something volts on a 48 volt system. Yes ma'am? Are, are these nickel iron batteries considered alkaline? Or are these they are. They are? They are. Yeah. Okay. okay. It's an alkaline solution, not an acid solution. Very caustic, by the way. You get a drop on it, and I did. It will burn. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and when I mixed it up, <laughs> when I mixed it up, it produces a lot of heat. When you mix up the, the additives and yeah, it with me. Yeah, that's yeah. dangerous stuff. I mean, you wear gloves, you wear a face guard. I mean, it's. It's it basically good. like handling. Right. I don't know anybody makes soap in here or anything like that. But the lies and so forth, you have to be really, really cautious because one splash in the eye and you might lose your eye. So you want to be really cautious when you're doing that. And uh, so be careful on that kind of stuff. Okay, we had a metal chair when we were, you and I were mixing that stuff up. Uh, you know, one of these commercial folding chairs? Uh -huh. A few drops got on there, it went right through the paint. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even, I guess that was after I went home, I didn't see what went on. But yeah. that, that stuff is, yeah, all of it is <laughs> positive. But it's all very, the thing is, people don't understand, even like sulfuric acid, you can literally use sulfuric acid on the ground, it doesn't hurt. But what happens is when you get it like on your vehicles and everything else, uh, you can actually, you know, it burns everything. But just because, a lot of people think because something's caustic, it's dangerous. Actually, I spray my fruit trees with a low sulfuric acid base, basically, for a fungicide. So it's not like it kills it to use sulfuric acid or dispose of sulfuric acid, you're not going to ruin your well, you're not going to ruin anything, unless you dump it in it, you know, that might not be too bright. But uh, a lot of people are worried about stuff that, uh, the main thing I worry about is to just be careful when you're mixing any of that stuff. All right, after you've figured out basically what you want to use, whether it's motors, you know, whatever it is, that's when you decide what size system you're going to build. Uh, according to that, and what you need to do, seriously, just write down. I've got two fans, I've got, you know, this, and I've got this, and I've got this. You know, whatever you've got that you run. Um, down here at the bottom, I wanted to really under make people understand this, because I also work with another couple that has a system, 
and it says if you go off grid, you will need to replace as much of your resistive heat, which is exactly what we got to get rid of, whether it's hot water heaters, whether it's dryers, whatever's resistive type heat. Because remember, if you're actually considering the cost of your kilowatt, it's a whole lot more than you think it is. Okay? Uh, you say, well, I'm spending 20 cents a kilowatt or 50 cents or a dollar. In general terms, if you figure that out, you're really spending more than that because you can't draw all your kilowatts. You can only draw the surface kilowatts and the rest of it's not usable. So anyway, uh, what I especially uh, like about these people, and I also told you what I did, in the mornings if you'll start your generator, a small one, run your coffee pot. I love coffee and I love an electric coffee pot. So run your coffee pot if you need to run your toaster and a few of those particular items while you've got a lot of extra current going into your system. And that is really the time to run your generator if at all possible is in the mornings, not in the evenings. A lot of people say, I don't want to go out there and start it at night. Well, most of the time, most of us aren't going to be using a lot of electric at night anyway. And it's cooler usually, so you have less refrigeration, you have everything running at a much lower output except lights. Lights are the number one thing we use at night. Uh, but I start my generator, they said every morning they start their generator, and they had a bigger one though. But they started the generator and ran it for a couple hours in the morning. I don't recommend running it for a couple hours unless that's how long it takes you to make your coffee, your breakfast, and all the other stuff. Uh, you don't have to put that much electric into anything. So it's according to how your lifestyle is. By the way, these people actually had a commercial refrigerator that's about $5,000. But it was used propane. It did not use electric. So. Uh, they weren't even using it for their refrigeration. Okay, the first requirement of an off-grid electrical system, of course, is to have some kind of generating system. Rather you use your solar panels, which is what I'm using. I've also got a small wind turbine, or big wind turbine, but I'm not using it right now. But while I was using it, I'm going to get it back going again. I actually took a trolling motor. Anytime you have a motor that has magnets, okay, that's the easiest one to set up for an off-grid system if you've got magnets. And that's because you don't have to induce a voltage into it to make it generate a voltage. Otherwise, if you have a non-magnetic one, you have to induce a current into the field winding, so you have to have an outside source. Calvin, how can people tell the difference between a magnet motor and a The magnet. best way that I know of, if you take and turn it by hand, a magnetic motor, you will feel the resistance every time you go through a field winding. And a non-magnetic motor, you just you can sit there and spin it, and it'll just sit there and spin for a while. But a magnetic motor will never spin for a while if you spin it. You will actually feel it every time it goes. Uh, I've actually got a couple of these little bitty generators that uh, went on bicycles. And uh, you can even turn them, and every time you turn them, you feel it. But I've taken uh, one other place that you find motors. I saw a washing machine, I can't think of what it's called, that was made in Australia. And they say that's one of the best motors you can find for making a generator. <coughs> and it's a flat motor, but it's about this big around. But it's a flat motor, and I don't remember the name. Somebody in here that's messing around with some of that might even remember a name of one of them. But it's made in Australia. <coughs> and, uh, but anyway, I've also used uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with satellites because I used to sell the big satellite systems. The old actuator arms on most of the old satellites had a little magnetic motor in them. Uh, Von Weiss was one of the best ones I knew out there. They were very heavy and, and any kind of magnetic motor, probably one of the better ones to get a hold of is a trolling motor. You know, if you find somebody throwing away a trolling motor, which they seem like they throw them away all the time. I actually advertised on Rollinet to pick up any scrap trolling motors from people a couple years ago. and. Uh, Never got any takers. I went in some magnetic motors. But uh, anything like that is the best of the, of the small ones. If you are really, really mechanically inclined, you can also take the regular generators that I'm talking about where it takes an induced voltage into the field windings. One thing nice about that, everybody's got to understand, is that all the new vehicles all have no magnets in them. They're all alternators with no magnets but they induce the voltage into the field. And what's so neat about that, you control your current by the amount of electric you put in the, mag in the field windings, which produces a magnet, it's what it is, electric magnet. So as you increase the current, 
the magnets get much stronger and then you decrease the current so that controls your voltage. That's how your voltage regulation works on them. <coughs> if you see some people on TV have advertised alternators for sale that they've modified, okay, and what they've done is actually pulled those windings out and put magnets in where the windings were. All right. Uh, does anybody here besides John have water for hydro? Hydro is the best. What's nice about hydro, if you have it available, is if you have a water supply, you never have to worry about if it's windy that day or if there's no sunshine. The only thing you do have to worry about, which John doesn't because his is spring fed, but you have to worry about them freezing up in the winter time. So you have to have a place that you have water that's either coming out of a spring or someplace where it doesn't freeze up. Hydro doesn't do any good in ice. <coughs> yeah, if you have hydro, it is the least expensive method of generating electricity pretty well. All right, and someone back here was talking about steam turbine driven. Uh, you can use steam, you can use wood, you can use solar, you can use propane, methane, hydrogen, alcohol, and just about any other cut and bustable. You know, any kind of uh, gas that you can produce to burn, produce to burn heat. Generators are almost a required backup source, even a very small one. And I don't recommend people buy, you know, huge generators unless you're planning on running them a lot. You know, if it's only for what you're needing, like I was talking about a while ago, offset, you're much better off to buy a small generator. First of all, you don't consume near the electric, the gas or whatever fuel you're using. And most people that run an 8 kW generator is probably pulling between 1 and 3 kW off of it. And they got all this extra that they're consuming electric on. Remember, it does run less gas when you're less loaded. But it's always using gas as long as it's running. The efficiency of a generator is not very good. Um, there are some chemical systems out there. That's what I'm actually messing with right now. That's why I'm doing so much study on organic chemistry. Uh, there's lots of ways to produce low amounts of electricity. You know, people seen potatoes used, people seen all kinds of stuff used to produce electric to light a light or something like that. Just remember, even a battery is a chemical system. Chemical systems are not a real option at this time, meaning mixing chemicals or doing stuff that way. Okay, that may soon be too. Cost to replenish and dispose of waste materials could improve greatly in the future. Remember, dry cell batteries as well as rechargeables and all other batteries are chemical <coughs> reactions. Uh, rechargeables can just have the process reversed over and over. Also, all burnables are chemical reactions. Yes, sir? Back to that generator running that on gas. <coughs> They can actually be in that generator sitting still, not moving around much. Uh, use that system called bubble, and it extends the amount of gas it takes to run that thing for hours. And that is a line that coming into gasol a jar of gasoline, and your engine sucking the gas out of this container, and it's really pulling the vapors. And so, if you've got a, a quarter, half gallon of gas, whatever, it lasts really a long time because your engine is actually just burning and pulling out the vapors. It's a bubble. And it'll, and it'll continue to produce enough vapors <coughs> to run it? Yes. This is a this is an old-timey system, and uh, I don't know if you can find it on the Internet or not. I don't have computers, but that system is really something that would extend the life or the number of hours you can run a generator really cheap on gas. You just okay. call it the bubble system? The bubble system, what I'm calling it. I don't know what else to call it. <laughs> I can draw you something to give you an idea what it does. Well, it, it sounds like they're basically just literally instead of sucking a gas off, they're sucking the vapor off and leaving a head space. You hit it. That's right. But anytime you can actually mix <coughs> your fuel, that's why, I, see, I mess with hydrogen for gas and everything else. Anytime you can mix another, propane is also mixed with gasoline now, quite often, and diesel fuel. And the reason it is is because any of your propane products, especially hydrogen and stuff like that. Hydrogen, first of all, is the smallest atom out there. So when it combines with the other stuff, which is in the uh, 
the diesels and so forth, which are all organic, they're all carbon compounds. Anything that'll break that compound down more makes it burn more, produce less and less uh, waste material, and does a whole lot less damage to the atmosphere. So if you can add hydrogen, hydrogen's number one, you know, uh, if you can add hydrogen. One other thing now, uh, to produce hydrogen, the best way to produce hydrogen if you want to, now there's plenty of chemical ways, but if you, a lot of people are actually re taking their, gener their solar panels and producing off of your, uh, oh, my mind went blank, where, where you actually put the electric in, electrolysis to produce the hydrogen gas on the one side and the uh, oxygen on the other side. Anyway, you take those and they actually take them and bubble them out into a water system and fill up so it actually has compressed hydrogen and oxygen. They can force that into the system and then whenever they drain it back off, they can use the, they use the hydrogen and the uh, oxygen with water pressure. Well, I got some friends of mine, they run a car on pure hydrogen with a full head school. And uh, I, can get, I can get you in contact with them. But uh, do you understand how they make hydrogen out with flashlight batteries? That's right. They ran that car on flashlight batteries. <laughs> I, I need to see that. <laughs> well, that's even more strange than that, that uh, they actually ran one motor on pure water and they had it, the electrical. See, lightning makes hydrogen, makes a hydrogen out of water. And so anyway, they was bringing the, the lightning and the plugs to this chamber and hitting the water and they had hydrogen right then. And that car ran on that. They got, they had two or three different setups. They actually blowed up some spark plug wires with too much voltage. Wow. Oh yeah, that was interesting. I get in touch with these two characters. I'd like to see more on that. And that's, hydrogen is probably well, going to be... on that Larry Rice program. Yeah. They've been on there before. Okay. The I just started watching him the other day. We recorded five of his shows, and I watched some of them. Some of his stuff is very, if you want to use the word, crude, in that they they don't really. It's sort of like I've watched some of these other off-grid shows and so forth. Some of the stuff they show you is very questionable. That the product they're producing is coming from the product they're showing. Yes, sir. I built one system for my truck, diesel. And it did produce hydrogen. It's just a problem with the tool. You have to have a lot more knowledge for that than I didn't have. Was that hydrogen induction to the intake you're talking about? Uh, with the separate little tanks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It works. Yeah, but that's <laughs> minuscule compared to running straight hydrogen. They had a Ford yeah. Edicor, they run on straight hydrogen. And see, that's what scares the oil companies. Because right. if you go down the road and you and you get, you're actually like jumper cable shoot, charging water and your engine sucks it in the intake, there's no pressure required like you mentioned. If you suck that down the intake, that's called use on demand. And you scare the daylights out of these oil companies because you can take and stop at a water hole and fill up your, your water where you're electrocuted and making the hydrogen and take off. You're not paying state tax, federal tax, city tax. Yeah. Well, you hey, the listen. Daylight, it's called if you use think on demand. It, if you think about it, though, what's coming out your exhaust? Water. That's right. You could actually collect your water from your exhaust, which is pure water, and put it right back through your system again. So, water is an amazing product when you break it down and rebuild it. And by the way, hydrogen is the most plentiful material on the, on the earth. Well, the oil companies and the media and most professorships, they tell you it takes high voltage to make hydrogen. No, it don't. When they're driving, that doodad that they use with them two flashlight batteries, you could hold it in your hand. And that was making enough voltage to turn that water into hydrogen. And that little car went down the road. As a matter of fact, they pulled a single axle trailer with it even. I want to see that because that's really pretty amazing. Yeah. And trust me, we're probably all going to be building one pretty soon if it works here. I don't want to delay you any longer, but I want to add something to that. I visited a man back in the 80s in Iowa, this genius guy, a farmer, he had this huge workshop. Like some factory, and he was doing exactly what you're saying, and he was producing it so that he could use it as, as it's produced, but not from storage. He also produced it in the, he had the hydrogen and oxygen going separately into two tanks, but he was doing what you are talking about also, and that was his main emphasis was creating uh, uses for this hydrogen that you uh, use as it's produced, yeah. so that when you're driving down the road, there's no hazard because there's no. Uh, no bulk of it. No bulk of it. Yeah. 
That's the whole thing with that. Yes, sir. Another thing, John knows a guy that produces, you burn uh, no. wood and it burns the smoke. Yeah, but it does stuff. Yes. That's a gasifier. <coughs> this guy, what's that guy's name, John? Yeah, we went over there and this guy's got a, he actually makes them and sells them, don't he? I don't think no, they aren't selling these. What? I got one for their own use and I don't sell them. <coughs> what, he had three or four in there, didn't he? There's they lots of drawings. The There's lots of drawings on gasifiers, yes. and I was just talking to him a while ago about the gasifier. I want to find out more about instead of using wood to actually get coal, <coughs> because coal has such a high content of of uh, burnable fuel in it, and without burning the coal, just heating the coal up and producing the gas. Where can you buy coal? Huh? Where can you buy coal today? <laughs> that's what I asked. And that's what he asked. Now, up there where I lived at in Jeff City, or I lived up by Tevis, we actually had an, an abandoned mine on our place, but you can walk around and gather it up a lot of places in, in Callaway County where it's on the surface of the ground because there was these clumps of coal in the ground. Uh, you know, it's literally just pits. When they drove, drilled my well, they dug out some coal. But there's a lot of coal deposits up there. I don't know if there's any coal deposits down here anywhere. I don't know. Okay. But uh, I'm sure you can find access to coal as long as you're not advertising it. Uh, people up there at least would have plenty of coal, and there's plenty, probably plenty of it around, but I know now you can only buy a low sulfur coal. And they did that on purpose so that you could pay more money and they have more control. All right, now yeah, I've lost my place. All right, I think I'm on the second part of the requirement of the off-grid system. For almost all off-grid system is a chart or is a requirement for a charge controller, which we've discussed quite a bit. And uh, the charge controller will monitor and adjust control input voltages, output voltages, input and output currents, amps, and a circuit that monitors storage battery temperatures and this is really important for two reasons. One of them is shorts, okay? And we'll shut down the charging system if excess heat from overcharge rate or shorted batteries are picked up from the temperature sensor. Temperature could be an issue from a fault in the load side too, which would need to also be addressed <coughs> by the charge controller to shut it down. And what that's talking about is if you have a charge controller and you want to fuse it on both sides, the input and the output side. Okay, the input side is very high because it's the current coming off to charge your system. The output side of your charge controller is going to be whatever you're charging. Charge controller is not something you use the electric off of for anything except to store it. Whether it's going into a battery, whether it's going into you know some chemical system you have, but a charge controller is strictly to charge the batteries, basically. You know to put in 12, 24, or 48 volts, whatever system you have. I always recommend the highest voltage system that you're willing to put in. The higher the voltage system, the more batteries required, of course. But the higher the voltage, the smaller the wires, and the lower the current. So you want to keep your voltage as high as you can. Also, another thing is, when you transfer electric, the higher the voltage, that's why we have, you know, even one megavolt transmission lines now. The higher you increase the voltage, <laughs> the lower the losses and the uh, farther you can transfer it without a loss. Of course, once they get to certain frequencies, then it changes also. But the charge controller is basically, I call it more important than anything except for maybe the batteries, but the charge controller is one of the most important things you have because it's going to, and the MTTPs, which is the high efficiency <laughs> ones, you want as much output as possible Yes, sir. Isn't that the brain of the system, actually? I call it the brain. Yeah. You know, the inverter is also a brain in one way because the inverter does so many different things besides just inverting the electric. But to me, the charge controller is probably the most critical part of a system. And a good charge controller pays for itself. Remember, if you buy a cheap charge controller that doesn't charge right, you may be only getting 60% of what you're putting into it you know, instead of 90-something percent. So a charge controller is really, really important on a system. And yes, I would call it the brain and the heartbeat of the whole system. And of course, we've talked about the third thing quite a bit already, and that's 
the batteries. Uh, deep cycle, large capacity, you want large places, you can get anything that gives you more amp hours for usage. Remember, don't spend too much money for amp hours versus buying another battery though. Uh, the amp hours you can still only use on a regular battery, not the nickel iron, but on a regular battery you can only bring them down to about 80% charge without damaging the battery. So you're not really looking at a battery and saying, well, gee, this thing has 100 amp hours and this one only has 40. What you're really looking at is you can only use a certain amount of either one of them. And if you pay four times as much for the high amp battery as you do for the other one, you're probably better off to buy four of the regular batteries. You know, if it's a couple times difference or a time and a half, get the higher amp hours. But it's really, really important to get as much usable storage. <coughs> Who cares that you got a 5,000 gallon tank if you can only run off the first 200 gallons, you know? Get you a 250 gallon tank and run off 200 gallons, you know? So. Either way, it's not necessarily better that you have all that base that you have to float your charge. Yes, John. Cal, you want to tell people about the Pulse Tech te uh, technology devices? Pulse I, tech. I don't know that much about it. You're using them and using them on your car, right? Yeah. But they preserve batteries. Would you mind sharing that well, with me? Um, the reason lead acid batteries go bad is because the sulfur buildup on the lead plates. That's pretty well known. What the Pulse Tech devices do, they send a reverse charge into the batteries and knock the sulfur off the plates. The town car out here, I've been using it now for 20 years. My car battery lasts twice as long as yours. They do, because I got the Pulse Tech device. And when I had the, uh, the, the lead acid batteries, we had uh, a $20,000 lead acid battery system with the Pulse Tech devices to get the maximum life out of the lead acid batteries. The Edison batteries, it's not an issue. But if you got Trojan batteries, now you can spend 20 grand real easy on these, right, Al? Yeah. Okay. So 50 bucks for a Pulse Tech device makes a lot of sense. <laughs> and that's that's what that is is a reverse charge. But remember, everything that bonds, uh, if you get into chemical more and more chemistry, there you go. What they're doing is releasing it, and making it fall off instead of staying on the plates whenever it coats the plates. And the coating of the plates is one of the things that drains your battery and takes the life away. The other thing that takes the life of a battery away, one thing especially if you have like my batteries are clear, one thing you want to look at is the gap underneath the battery itself, the plates, that's one of the biggest places a battery ruins is it builds up in the bottom and shorts out the plates. <coughs> and if you could literally, I was told by a guy that used to recycle and redo batteries, he said a lot of times if you have the battery, and I wouldn't do it because I scared you, but he said if you'll take a battery and hold it and drop it on like a piece of wood or something, you can literally make a battery work again for many time, many years lots of times because all that's happened is the deposits on the bottom have shorted out the plate. And he said he's done it, but I didn't do that. So I didn't want to get the acid on me first of all. Yes, sir? In the olden days, the batteries used to be a, a tar or a soft top. And a friend of mine would cut that and pull them up and, and clean that out and put uh, no. new, a, new acid and in it? Put it back in the yep. and put acid back in it. Unbelievable. I think that that's what, uh, that's one of the reasons they made them to where they're sealed now yeah. because yeah. I remember the old batteries. Yeah. They literally had a seal around the edge. You could take it right out and take the whole battery apart. Yeah. <laughs> but that's one of the biggest places the battery loses is there. Also, I think deliberately the stuff that they divide, especially on the uh, the high capacity batteries, the stuff that they make to separate the batteries, if you look at them as they get older, they break down more and more, and that stuff there causes issues. So, Cal, yes. we're at 10 o'clock. So. Okay. 10 minute break, guys. <coughs> I hope you're not all full. I'm <laughs> 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 
everything to do with building if you want to build it yourself. And it's a very, very interesting book. Uh, just so you know, if you do something like this, um, if you get Barry or somebody like that with either a CNC or a machine shop, always the more accurate it's built, the better it works. Uh, if you start shifting your coils a little one way or the other, what happens is, instead of getting a good pure sine wave, you start getting chops in it and everything else for every error in a degree of wherever you place everything. So it's very critical to do it right and have somebody that can do, you can do pretty well everything I would say except possibly something like that. You might have somebody machine it or something. So that's the two literature things I have. Now I have different literature on I sell the Magnum uh, inverters. And these are midnight midnight charge controllers, the one I've been using. I'm looking at some other charge controllers. And uh, what did you just tell me a while ago on that charge controller that's made here in America? Pardon me? The charge controller that's made here in America that's. Yeah, it's a BZ Products. BZ. Baker Zebra Products. Yes. And they're in Saint Louis. Do they make them in St. Louis or do you know where they make them at? Uh, 